I know Paul from the Roswell Photographic Society, and Paul is on the board at the Photographic Society, uh, Roswell Photographic Society, and very active. And has, I saw him give a presentation there, so I asked him to do one for us here, and he was good enough to say yes, he would do that. And I think you'll find his work very interesting. He's a good photographer, very different kinds of things he photographs, and he does them well. Paul Peterson. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, like you mentioned, I've given this presentation just once before in February. Um, so since then, I've added a few things, kind of fine-tuned a couple things. We'll see how it goes today. I think you all find it um, worth your time investment. Um, for those uh, just coming in, I do have a handout. Uh, you don't necessarily um, need it for the presentation, but it does follow along with uh, what we're covering today. So um, one here. There we go. I'm going to just uh, to head into um, the introduction part. I'm going to just read this to you because I can never remember exactly the way I want to say it. Uh, many of us reach a point uh, in our photography life when we get very comfortable with our favorite subjects, locations, and end products. But from time to time, we feel the itch to step out of our comfort zone and try something new. So my goal this afternoon is to inspire you to start using some unique shooting techniques, motivations, subjects, and delivery formats that I've found rewarding. So this is the uh, grand uh, outline of the, the uh, sheet that you have in front of you. And again, uh, we're going to do a couple more things for the introduction here. And then head into subject rotation, the kind of subjects I shoot. Uh, again, maybe inspire you to try some of those. Uh, and then um, what I, it's kind of hard to describe, but in-camera subject effects or highlighting, things you do while you're shooting. Uh, that might be a little bit different. And then uh, unique end products, I'll explain that when we, we get there. And if we have some time uh, remaining, I'll go a little bit into my workflow, some things that you might find uh, helpful. So, um, as way introduction, uh, my path to the photographer I'm today. Uh, like many of you may have been involved in your high school photography uh, club. And, uh, yeah, let me set some more of these over here for you. Uh, <coughs> And uh, so that's where I learned, you know, basic stuff about film, even rolling, uh, black and white, processing some film, but mostly just shooting events around uh, high school. Um, a little bit more in college as well, but uh, pretty much, you know, I started with the film camera, and then, like again, many of you, maybe around the year 2000 or so, uh, digital cameras uh, came on the market. And then for me, it was a long pause between that and moving up, up to a, um, a camera with interchangeable lenses. And for me, it was, it was mostly an issue of my kids were growing and out of the home, so I had a little bit more margin in my time and in my financial, you know, in my budget to invest in a little bit more serious camera. So the first camera was a Samsung. I don't know if you all know that Samsung had a, a professional line of cameras. Uh, the one I ended up uh, getting uh, was the uh, NX500, which is an APS-C uh, sensor camera, and uh, as soon as I bought it, that's when so, um, Samsung decided to get out of the professional camera business and focus, of course, on cell phone sensors and stuff like that. But I really did enjoy this camera. Uh, you know, again, semi-entry level for um, um, interchangeable lens camera. Uh, so I started eyeing something better and bigger. You know, Sony had uh, their full frame um, uh, 7R3. Um, and I kind of put this sheet together on my own to show me where I'd be going, you know, from and to, and then a lens kind of I had my eye on that I'd hopefully get. So I soon did upgrade in, in uh, 2019 to that camera. And again, the, the, the thing I was mostly excited about was the uh, increased um, resolution in addition to it being a full frame camera. And I'll get into why I was excited about that, the way I use it. Um, that extra resolution. A lot of people don't uh, need for the kind of shooting they do, but I, I do a lot of cropping basically, and I'll get into that. One thing that was not a motivating factor for me was the fact that uh, the, there was an addition of a viewfinder. And the reason is I'd gotten pretty used to using the screen on the viewfinder less, you know, Samsung. And I'd, I'd learned some things about some advantages of using the screen over using, um, the, using the viewfinder. 
So uh, this is kind of wordy thing, but this is the advice I actually give uh, when a, a young or starting photographer would ask me what's my best single piece of advice. And this is, this is the long version of what I would tell them, but um, uh, one thing you'll notice about my work is that I try my best to shoot at or near ground level. Why? Because most of the time, the ground, especially uh, pavement or red, you know, Georgia clay, is unattractive, if not downright ugly. So I avoid shooting it as much as possible. To reduce the amount of exposure that the ground gets in an image, one must move the camera to a position lower than one can comfortably look through the viewfinder. That's basically you know, the physics of it. So my recommendation, ditch the viewfinder. Uh, look at the screen. Sure, sometimes bright sunlight conditions make the viewfinder the better option. But when you get in the habit, and that's the key word there, of using the screen uh, with your camera near the ground, a uh, new perspective opens up a whole new world for you. And a lot of you are, may think, well, yeah, once in a while I'll see, oh, yeah, it would be better to shoot this uh, ground level, so I'll take, you know, off the viewfinder and put it on, look my, on the screen. But I don't know, for me personally, I know that if I got so used to using the viewfinder, I'd forget about those times and not do the shooting at lower levels. So I just avoid it altogether and do my best with the screen. That's just me, again, it's a personal preference. Uh, interesting, I thought it was fairly unique, but I did some Googling and, and um, there seems to be a growing trend, more and more people using the screen. And if you look at your videographer friends, most of them, if not all of them, do use the screen because of the way they shoot. But, uh, you know, I'm, I advise the same thing for the same reasons that they do. So here's just a couple, you know, prime examples of shooting really low with the cameras actually on the ground um, there. And especially shooting these uh, uh, skaters at the park, the pavement is always overly bright. I had to dim it, you know, in post even this much. But you get a whole bunch of that in the picture, you know, you know the lower third even. And it really is distracting, at least for me it is. So, so that's why I shoot 10 to the ground. And this is kind of a strange kind of illustration of that, but trying to use the viewfinder versus the extra range you get if you just look at the screen, get the overhead shots as well. Uh, for example, here's overhead shot. I, I do that, don't use those quite as much as on the ground type shots. But um, anyway, uh, point two for uh, ditching the viewfinder is horizontal uh, versatility versus just the vertical. And the reason I'm using this image is because to shoot this image, I had to be, you know, down shooting almost at ground level. But uh, in order to kind of fine tune where, how I wanted to shoot this, I ended up the way I liked it, where he was right off to the side there. Some of you may have thought maybe it should be a little more centered, whatever, as personal taste. But to do that, if you had the viewfinder down here, you'd have to be doing the crab type thing back and forth, you know, to try to get that horizontal. Whereas with the camera, you're just, you can see the screen, you can do it so much more easily. Again, it's something you may not have thought of before, or you might think that's kind of silly, you know. But uh, again, that's just my case for building for, for using the screen more than the viewfinder that you may be uh, used to. So on to uh, subject rotation. And I use the rotation because I really do kind of rotate through these various subjects on a bi-monthly basis, I'd say. I, you know, I don't shoot two uh, dog park weekends in a row. I wait a month and a half or so. So that's why I call it rotation, and we'll go into a little bit of these as we go. Um, in uh, Lightroom, you know, you can um, group your shots as you're loading them into Lightroom and starting your editing into, you know, the folders or drawers. And uh, this is last year, all the separate drawers I did, and you'll see this. I'll bring it up and highlight the different subjects as we go through them. So the first uh, category is just landscapes and wildlife, or, or basically nature. So here's where, again, throughout the year, I shot something dealing with nature. And I have some starting recommendations. Now, as we go through the subjects, I'm going to have a slides like this where I list a number of recommendations. And again, if you, again, nature shots, well, a lot of us uh, pretty much do that. And so some of these may seem a little bit elementary to you. But again, I'm, I'm presenting in case for those who are maybe always been into sports photography and are thinking, oh, maybe I might try some landscape photography. What are some uh, helpful hints? So I've got a number of these type of slides. And on your way out, I will have an additional handout from the one you've got that lists on a, a single two-sided sheet all of these recommendation uh, pages, slides on one paper. So you can uh, make note now. But if later on you think, oh, I might want to shoot some dog park you know, pictures, you can get this shot, uh, this, this uh, sheet and look at the, the suggestions that I have. 
As far as uh, landscape uh, recommendations, before heading out on a photo walk, decide the best lens for what you're planning to shoot and leave the camera gear backpack behind. And again, that's a personal preference. Some of you have found it really helpful to have a full set of lenses with you as you're going out, but I love traveling very light, very light. So I always think, where am I gonna go? What kind of man am I shooting? What's the best lens for that? I just carry my camera and my lens. And that's again what I'd recommend to someone just so they're not toting around a heavy bag of, of lenses. And uh, next one, slow down. Uh, to look around on your way out to what you think will be the main attraction. You might miss something wonderful. Uh, example, dunes at the beach. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to miss some beautiful dunes, but a lot of people just think, oh, you know, waves and sunlight, uh, sunsets and whatnot. Um, but uh, again, slow down. Um, a lot of times uh, when I'm out on a walk, you know, I'll oftentimes just stop and turn around and see if I miss something from this angle and look up instead of just down and around. So just take your time. Again, something uh, to recommend for a, a new uh, photographer just heading into nature uh, shooting. If you end up with a lens too great a focal length to shoot a wide scene, shoot a series of overlapping images uh, which can be stitched together in post. Again, it's the whole idea of if you don't have a backpack full of lenses you can switch to and you end up with the wrong lens for a particular shot you want to get, that's, uh, I'll show an example of that in just a minute. Uh, and then take advantage of foggy, whether it be day or at night, uh, and rainy weather for unique captures. And again, that might be a no-brainer for a lot of you, but a lot of people think, oh, it's a rainy day, I'm not going to go out and shoot. But those are oftentimes the best opportunities to do that. Here's an example of in the fog. I live in uh, Martin's Landing over in Roswell, my wife and I do. And uh, it often fogs up there around the lake. And this was late at night with the uh, lamp posts, uh, the lights on at night. And uh, just, again, wonderful opportunity to get some interesting fogs. And th uh, this may have been the same day as the light was coming, morning light was coming. You can see the sailboat there in the distant fog there. And uh, someone just happened to be on the path there walking. Um, I just, again, thought it was a, a fine capture for um, something like that. Again, here's the example of dune shooting at the, you still get the ocean there and the sunrise, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's great just to capture the, the dune. Um, this is an example of multi-shot image. You know, I had a fairly, um, uh, it might have been an 85 millimeter lens, I think, with me, or a, a, maybe a 70 to 180, something like that. And I wanted to get this whole scene, but I only could get a portion of it. And so, uh, advance the next one. There we go. So those are the eight shots, basically, I took, and then I was able to stitch them back together. Obviously, there's more overlapping of the actual images, but um, we'll get into... Uh, how to how to do that a little bit later on. But that's an example if you end up with the wrong lens and you think, well, I can't quite get the whole thing. Um, just shoot a series of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, images and, and stitch them together in post. Uh, wildlife recommendations. Shoot at ground level or at least their eye level so as to get more interesting backgrounds than just the ground or water. Again, that's something I'm going to keep repeating because, it, again, it's something that's easily, easily overlooked, especially for folks just starting. But uh, it's, 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 to me, it's pretty basic. When shooting small creatures such as birds or butterflies, don't shoot or crop too tightly. I think they discussed that probably this morning a little bit. Seek for surrounding elements which would complement the main star. So this is an example where I could have cropped it in just the butterfly almost in the center, and that would have been fine. But I just saw that the, the uh, composition of this worked much better if I just kept it broad rather than cropping in closely. Uh, same thing here, would have been okay just to get that guy right there, but I like the sailboat and the fact that he's looking out in that direction. So again, just think about those things. You think, oh man, there's the bird, let me get the bird, but keep in mind what you're trying to shoot, the whole thing. Uh, same thing here, a little bit. This is more of an example, again, of shooting at ground level up at, or at their eye level of, of the subject. Again here, this was the water, you know, the camera was almost on the water for this shot. I just think it really brings it in where you can get the head of a goose or a duck up in the sky. I mean, that's my, always my goal because it, it just, to me, it brings a lot more uh, you're right there um, rather than shooting down at the water or shooting down at the ground. Same thing here at the beach. It's hard to get these guys because they're running away from me all the time, but uh, this was like uh, last spring, I think it was, when we were at the beach. Uh, getting down at ground level to get that. Okay, this is heading into, uh, before we head into um, other types of categories, I, I don't want to make a distinction between um, 
what I shoot for myself and why I shoot for others, and getting into a little bit of motivation, what motivates you to shoot pictures. And uh, so again, landscapes, wildlife, you know, nature shots. Um, sometimes I shoot them for the folks who live in our community. They love to see our lake, our, you know, the nature around it. And so, but most of the time, it's for me just to enjoy trying to get a, a good shot. Um, all the other categories we're going to cover are pretty much due for others. I'm thinking in minds of, would this person like this photo? How would they like it? You know, me to spend time on working on the pictures. And so it gets into a little bit, why do you photograph for others? And to be honest with you, part of the reason I went into this, I'm very anical in trying to, you know, outline something like this, is once in a while I get a little bit of an evil eye from a professional photographer who's uh, trying to make a living, you know, shooting events. And the type of events, though, that I tend not to shoot, I'm, I've, I rarely uh, am at event shooting to give away the pictures free to the people where there's also a professional there trying to sell his pictures. I think it's only happened once, and that was at Will's Park. Uh, shooting the horses, and I was only there for like uh, three hours out of a you know 16 hour weekend that he was there shooting pictures. So anyway, this is why I went into this a little bit. You can either be shooting for family or friends, you know, just events, uh, supportive causes, you know, like um, adopt a dog. You know, they've contacted me, say, hey, can you come shoot our dog? Some people, you know, adopt a dog kind of thing for pay. And like I'm just saying, there's professionals, and I don't know, and the number of you may be in that category. And then a, f a fourth category that might be pretty new to you, or you haven't thought it in these terms, but to be an influencer. Um, and you think of influencer like on a YouTube, someone who's very popular in a company or a cause, hire them to be an influencer of their fan base, in a sense. So the way it works for me in photography is um, I shoot an event at no charge. And again, typically I'm just talking about like at a dog park and a bunch of people have their dogs there and they say, oh, I noticed you're taking a picture. Can I see? Can I, where, where can I see the pictures that you're taking? That kind of thing. Um, but then say, I'm not, even, I'm not charging. Or at the equestrian center, same thing like that, sports centers, um, events. Uh, then the subjects of those pictures, when they get you see it, um, they take note and they check out your profile where you've posted those pictures of them. And then they read and possibly adopt your message. You know, you're trying to influence them. You use the uh, gift that you've got, the skill that you've got to um, hopefully impress on them a message that's important to you. So the way that works for me is I have little business cards that I've printed out. Moo.com, great place to get business cards because they'll let you do a face uh, side. And the back side, you can actually have them put a different picture of yours on every one of the cards, which is pretty cool for about the same price as regular business cards. And I used to do that uh, for this, but I decided to change it. It'll be more direct with the back side. But if you read the first side there, uh, uh, Paul Peterson, uh, hobby, uh, photo hobbyist, always looking for something different to capture. In two to three days, go online here to view and freely download pictures that I took today or use the QR code on the back where it says the pictures there. And then I've got the actual URL in case they don't do the QR code thing. And uh, so on the back side is again, sort of the beginning of my, you know, I'd like to impress people the, the message that why I don't charge, I consider my photography to be a blessing from God and I want to use it to be an influencer for him. If you are blessed by my free services, you have God's love for you and his work in my life to thank for it. Uh, if you have a few minutes, check out my story how I came to this perspective and they could do that by going there or they could just go to their pictures and see what the pictures I did, I posted of them. So when they click on that and they go to uh, this uh, basic index of uh, albums that I have on my events Flickr profile, I have two uh, Flickr profiles, one for events and one for my creative work. Um, they'll see uh, most likely the, the newest album that's there in the upper right or left and uh, so in this case, it was a soccer game I shot down, shot down at West End in, in uh, uh, Atlanta. And there was, uh, goodness, I can't read either one but here, but I think 174 photos, 100 views so far. And um, when they click on that, uh, to any of these particular um, things, and they go to the album, and they click on the about, and you can't really see it, but there's a, an about there. It brings up the description of the album. And uh, in this case, I say images are free to download. Help, um, helpful note below, you may need to press show more, you know, bring this up. Um, uh, this weekly event, I, then I basically do a summary of what the shoot was about. And then I have my notes about how to do the downloading. And then I say what motivates me to shoot sets like this. Find out in my about section, I have the link to 
my about section, and that's where I kind of pretty much go into, uh, again, the message I like to impress on them. And you can check that out later with the links that'll, the, the handout that I've got here that's got all these links, obviously you're not going to be able to do anything with this, but we, the, the, uh, the group will send you the um, uh, electronic version or the link to the electronic version where you can just click on all the links and, and check out all this, these uh, um, sets that I've, uh, I'm referring to. So that was my events where I send people who I've shot, you know, pictures of them doing something and they want to see that. But then on my creative work profile, um, where I pretty much shoot uh, or put um, things that are more creatively bent. And again, some of those events, pictures are creative enough. I bring them and copy them into uh, the appropriate uh, folder here. So um, you can see that there's some category ones at the beach, surfing and so on. But then I have bi-monthly um, uh, albums every two months. Uh, and they, they tend to be 100 to 200 images in each. And uh, Again, that's the, the um, uh, main focus of my creative work thing is where I, I assemble those. And again, there's some other um, things like I have the best of, uh, the 10 best that I thought were, were good for 2021. I think the 2022 is there as well. At the end of every year, I, I create a, a sort of a best of my pictures so people can see what I consider the better part of my um, set for the year. Other Another online destination for some of my photographs is Google Maps. How many of you have ever posted a Google Maps with any of your images? Again, it's a, it's a great place. Uh, I, um, you can see down there, I've put up about 5,500 since uh, 2016. I've had about 24 million views. And some of them are locations that when they see the a photo that you've uploaded, in this case, this church in Savannah that I shot just this last March, um, they will sometimes put it as the prominent picture for that location on Google Maps. And so it'll get, in this case, one million views of that shot that I took just again in uh, last March. So there's a couple others. One was at Piedmont Park. One was at Centennial High School where my uh, kids all graduated from. So it's just kind of an interesting thing, a, a, a place to post. And then another one is uh, Nextdoor. I don't know if you've all used Nextdoor. It's mostly for community-based things where people are complaining about this, that, and the other in their local communities. Um, but uh, when, when my picture set is geared towards a particular area, like Martin's Landing, where my wife and I live, uh, in this case, you know, that first example up there um, uh, around the lake, um, met at the, the dog park. Again, that's nearby enough, so I went ahead and posted there as well some pictures. So people will see, you know, again, their community or their dogs, <laughs> in that case, at uh, on, on uh, next door. All right, on to the dog park. Speaking of dog parks, for as far as um, subject matter. And here you can kind of see, I shoot every other or every, you know, month and a half. Uh, matter of fact, last year I didn't shoot as many probably times as I, I usually do. Um, you know, everybody loves dogs. You know, at the dog parks, you can get some good interaction between the owners and their dogs uh, or interaction with, with each other. I mean, you can shoot your own dog for some artistic, you know, shots, but at a dog park, all the dogs are interacting. You get some uh, great, um, great uh, interaction shots. Uh, recommendations for that, focus on capturing the interaction between dogs, but avoid shots where they're just nipping at each other. And I just had a hard time with that sometimes. Oh, they're interacting, click, click. And it's just, ah, rah, 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 that's not the greatest shots. Shoot a dog at eye level so as to get more interesting backgrounds instead of just the grass or worse dirt. If the dog park is split between large and smaller dogs, remember to switch between the two to get a variety of shots regardless of your preference. Again, if you're shooting for people, um, to let them see, you know, creative shots of their dogs, you know, big dogs, little dogs, it doesn't matter. Everyone loves their, their dogs, so go ahead and switch between the two and get a variety in your set. Uh, be prepared to give uh, your posting location on the internet to those wanting to see pictures of the dog. If you don't want to use your personal website, consider using Google Maps, et cetera, as I just mentioning that. So here's another couple examples, interaction shots. Sometimes just a standalone shot, depending on the look on their face here, are, are good shots as well. Um, the fun thing for me uh, about the dog park shots is uh, all my creative shots, I add a caption. And for the dog park shots, I usually, um, you know, have the most enjoying, you know, time of, of, of coming up with captions. Most of them, it's uh, putting words in their mouth. I can't remember the, uh, the technical word for that, but... Um, 
personifying the dogs. Um, this one is one of my favorites because the look on the faces look exactly like that threatening tone in the, in the statement there. Um, so again, that, that's for me a very enjoyable part, and I don't know if you ever thought of shooting at a dog park before, but those are the kind of shots you can end up with. Horses, equestrian events. Um, I know I live pretty close to uh, Wills Park, and so I uh, go there again about every other month or um, a month and a half. Again, last year I didn't do quite as many, I think, as I normally do. You get some grit interaction between the trainers or the riders and the horses. Obviously, the jump shots, the action shots, those are kind of basic. Um, uh, just some uh, quick recommendations. Shoot, again, there's a recurring theme here. Shoot at lo uh, low as possible for a more dramatic angle. Avoid shooting a rider as they are heading away from the camera, especially as they perform a jump. And again, I see a ton of people always posting pictures of horse jumps, and it's like, the backside of the riders, you know, the focus of the, of the, of the thing when they're shooting when they're jumping away from the camera. So just simple things like that, keep in mind. Uh, when the horse is close, don't spook the horse by bending down uh, for the shot. So like this uh, previous shot here, it's pretty low, shooting up, getting the, in the sky and thing instead of the dirt. So to do that, when you're doing that, um, you got to keep in mind if you're down here, and I've had to be told this by the people that were there because I was fairly new. I was shooting, you know, up like this, and the people said you can't really do that when you're too close to the horse because the horse doesn't know what you're doing. They think you're going you know, to spring up and surprise them or something. And so you can either shoot from the waist high, you know, like this, shooting up, uh, or you can set your camera on a mini tripod, you know, the little small ones that uh, the A high, and uh, set it on the ground, preset the angle and the focus. And then most cameras, you can get a remote uh, um, shutter release, like about this size. And then when they, they're coming for the jump, you just hold it down and do rapid fire shots. And uh, you get the shot that way. You can find which is the best shot of the, the rapid fires. Uh, use your camera's silent shutter. That's pretty obvious. You might run into a little bit of a problem with distortion, depending on the speed of the um, shutter release. but. Uh, yeah, you, want to, you don't want to spook the horses when they're jumping by hearing a bunch of clicking sounds from your camera. Kind of basic, but again, you might forget that. Uh, try panning blur shots. Shut the, the shutter speed down to 120th to 150th, depending on how close they are to you. Um, yeah, this is depending on the speed and the uh, proximity to the subject. And I've got some examples of that. Well, first example is that, again, it might be a trip for some of you to go to Wills Park. It's in Alpharetta, but it's the one that's got the most events going on every single weekend. Uh, there might be some, uh, I, I tried looking around for something comparable in this area, and I just really couldn't find anything that was as, as good of a uh, dependable um, schedule for them uh, with events. So this kind of thing with very low, you're on a hill and you're getting all that uh, um, bouquet, you know, Effect in the background um, at Wills Park, uh, you can see the two rings there that I highlighted. Um, this is a uphill coming down um, up from the barns, and there's you know where I would stand shooting that way or shooting that way. And this is a downhill going uh, down to the competition and the warm up rings. So that's how I got that last shot. Is I if I see someone coming up from the barns or up from uh, the competition rings, I run over to that area and I try to get a good shot. And um, you know that, that's kind of um, image I usually get. Again, the jump shots, extremely show shots with the trainers and uh, maybe family members in the backdrop there. Um, down in the barns where they're you know prepping the horse. This I used a 500 millimeter mirror lens, you know, the ones that are they got the horrible bouquet. They got the what they call them, the donut hole bouquet back there. I try to minimize it as much as possible. But I was just, you know, eons away from this person, and it looks like, you know, it's just dead on. And it just, you could do some interesting things with 500 millimeter lenses. You don't have to spend a fortune. I think it's spent 150 bucks or 100 bucks on this 500 uh, mirror lens. Um, again, low angle. I think I used the tri mini tripod for that one because that would have been too close to freak the horse out and the rider too. Um, this is a panning blur shot. Again, that's when you slow your shutter speed down to the point um, where you get some blur, but you're panning exactly the same rate as the subject. And if you do a rapid fire, you know, set of 20 shots, one of those in that 20 might be dead on where you're panning exactly the same speed. So the subject is, 
is very um, sharp and still, and the background is what's all blurred. Uh, and sometimes you can do five of those type of shots and not get anything. So it's kind of risky if someone says, hey, shoot me, ride it, doing this, doing this ride, and you only do panning blur shots, and none of them turn out, you know, it's a risk, but uh, it's worth it. I, I, there's another panning blur shot. Um, especially hard with horses. With cars, it's easy to do because they're on a plane uh, level going straight. Horses are going up and down, you know, they're galloping or whatever. So you have to get them at the arc of their, their you know, what they're galloping or trotting, whatever. So th it's uh, panning blur shots of horses, it's, it's especially difficult. Okay, so this is question centers schedule for, I think it was this year or last year. And you can see every weekend there's something going on. So, um, you know, you can look them up on the website and make a trip down there and I think it'll be rewarding for you. Uh, one event that they have every year in the fall typically is this dad's derby where the father of the normal, you know, younger participant in, in competition, uh, they all dress up, as, I guess near Halloween or something like that, and they compete against each other. So this is an example of uh, one normal competitor's dad and he was teaming up, I think, with another dad, and it was like a good and bad, you know, this, he was a thief with the, the bags of uh, money that they stole from the bank kind of thing. And they have the judges there on the side judging um, each um, dad and how well they do. So this was an example of extremely low shot. I had the camera on the ground, you know, basically shooting underneath the rail here up at him so I could get him in the sky instead of down at the dirt and with, you know, too much distraction from the background um, uh, crowd there. Here's another shot from that event where the whole family kind of decided to dress up uh, for the uh, for the event. Okay, one thing that you'll find in the Equestrian Center's uh, schedule are non-equestrian actually events, and they're they're basically dog training or ag agility uh, events. And there's usually only two or three per year, so this is like a composite of a number of, of shots that I took at one of those. So again, if you like dogs and you want to shoot something different. Um, they go through these little obstacle courses, and uh, especially if you get them with the, um, their owner, they just love these shots. I mean, I, I shot one uh, maybe three hours straight and got maybe, uh, maybe 50 people, maybe more, and it, it got like 600 views on that one album because everyone wanted to have pictures of them with their dog doing something special, you know. Uh, okay, so before we go on, any questions so far? None. Okay, we'll, we'll keep going then. On to sports, uh, starting with uh, high school uh, type activities. And again, I shoot a bunch of those. Well, this is all, all of the sports related shoots that I, that I do. And again, none of these are, are for sale. I do them so that, post them on there, all the participants in these sports say, hey, there I am, and share it with their friends. and. And uh, just a lot of people appreciate the work you put into shooting their events. Um, so starting with basketball, recommendations, get permission from the coach in advance to be on the floor. That's, you know, pretty basic. Shoot the starting lineup introductions, which precedes the game. You'll oftentimes forget about, it. oh, the game starts at uh, 2. Okay, I'll get there at 2. And then you'll miss some of the stuff that goes on before. Uh, sit on the floor for those camera angle, as repeat, <laughs> move to a new corner of the court, each quarter uh, remaining nearest the home team basket. Uh, use a lens somewhere between 28 and 150. I think, uh, um, uh, was it uh, Tamron came out with a 50 to 150 recently, and I've got my eye on that because you really want to have a low focal range to get them when they're right there at, at the basket that you're sitting nearest. But then you also want to get the down court shot, so that's where you need the, the longer um, focal length. Uh, set your camera, and this is my recommendation. You can play around it however you want if you haven't done these before and you want to try to shoot a game. Set your camera to manual F2.8, uh, 150th uh, of a second. A lot of people say that's way too slow to stop the motion, but I've never found a problem at 1 500th. A lot of people would do 1 800th or 1 1,000th of a second, and that's fine, but then you're getting less light in. You'll have to mess with the higher ISO and therefore do more, uh, more uh, digital noise cleanup at, in post. So I, I found that that's a good combination. The 2 8, again, doesn't give you much depth of field. If you can go higher, that's great. Uh, 1 500th, set the ISO to auto, and then just do rapid fires. And uh, 
you'll have to call through a lot of pictures, but you'll come up with some, some great ones. Uh, use Denoise AI by Topaz Labs or similar software in post to reduce the digital noise and to sharpen. Again, the courts even in most modern high schools are fairly dim for most cameras to shoot action. I guess you have somewhat the same problem with football but, um, games, but I, I haven't shot many of those. So you'll be doing a bit of noise reduction with your high, higher ISOs um, in these settings. And then keep an eye out for audience reaction the game scores and action. And I don't know why I have a significant problem with that. I'll see that, oh, they just scored. And I don't think to you know, pan to the audience and have them going like that. You know, I, it's just something I keep my eye on the ball most of the time where the ball is. Uh, this is an example shot of the uh, warm up uh, or introductions at the beginning of the game. The, the uh, captains or the, uh, the main um, starting players come through a line of, of their um, cheerleaders and their team to be introduced. So getting those, that, that's a good thing to, to shoot. Again, low angle, it's just most oftentimes the best angle to go is to have the camera as cl close to the floor shooting up as possible. Um, it's just another example of um, uh, the ladies uh, in high school, their basketball games get far less attention. So they especially love it when you show up and shoot their games. Again, just let the coach know so the coach can tell them you're going to be doing that so they, they know who the photographer is. This is an example of down court shot. And the reason I would, I would get that is because uh, he's getting a the rebound there, but he's got the whole whole team, um, the, the especially rowdy part of the, the crowd, there in the backdrop. And that's the kind of shot you often get, or that someone jumping high to get the rebound there. This is an example of uh, this crowd shot again. This is the opposing team guy waiting to get the ball from the ref. And the home team was giving this guy just a little bit of a hard time, like, oh, you're going to mess it up kind of thing. So I, I just love the composition and the, uh, the story behind that, that, that shot. Again, keep your eye out for those. Wrestling matches, I haven't shot that many. They're not obviously as action-packed, but they are interesting. Get permission from the coach, like I said uh, before and the others. Uh, get to the event early enough to get shots of the whole team warming up, even those who won't. Uh, compete that evening. If you show up early, uh, especially for baseball and some other sports, a lot of the people on the team don't get to play in the game. And so they appreciate you being there, shooting them, at least warming up and participating um, in, the, in the evening. And that's true with wrestling um, a lot of times, depending on the size of the team, I guess. Uh, place your camera right on the corner of the mat for the best opportunities to capture the facial expressions. Again, I'll show you a couple examples here. Uh, and then shoot from the visitor side of the mat so you get the home team in the background. And so again, this is an example of on the mat, so you get the facial expressions there. And this example of getting the home team in the backdrop rather than getting the visitor team in the backdrop. Why, why would you want that? So, so you'll shoot from the visitor side. Uh, again, practical things, but you know, hopefully I'll help you out if you want to do one of those shoots. Uh, baseball and softball recommendations. Again, they're like a bunch of arrive early enough to get shots of the team, warming up together. Most of the team will not get any game time. Uh, shoot the game from a number of locations, and I'll show an example of each of these. Uh, over the outfield fence for the introduction of the home team lineup and the national anthem. And for the last one there, you know, typically the flag is in the middle of the outfield uh, fence, and so everyone's turning that direction, so grab some shots of the team and then uh, turn, you know, honor the flag yourself. Um, beside, the next location would be beside the guest team dugout for captures of the home team batters, as well as the pitcher and the catcher. And again, I'll show you an example of those. Uh, behind the catcher for head-ons, uh, head-on captures of the pitcher, and then back to the outfield fence for head-on shots of batters. Um, and that, you know, you, you need a good lens or a good high-resolution camera to and I'll show you again the example. Um, beyond the left field fence, in line with first and second base while um, the other team is up at bat. And again, I'll show you an example of what you can get there. And then stay on the uh, round after the game to shoot the uh, coach's team talk. A lot of people just head out after the game, think it's over, but not for them. Okay, here's an example warm-up shot. Again, a lot of these guys may not be in the game, but at least you can get them warming up. Ears from the outfield fence shooting inward for the singing of the national anthem. And then here is on the visitor's dugout side shooting towards, again, you get the nice team lineup there in the background. 
uh, with the batter. And this is the same position shooting the pitcher when the other team's up. And then this is behind home plate. And again, I don't go infield. I'm always behind the fence. Usually the fencing is coarse enough. My lens is able to shoot from behind the fence, so I never have to go on the inside and worry about getting struck by a ball. Um, so that's a pitcher, and then him checking out the guy trying to lead off a second base there. Another kind of shot you can get uh, from behind home plate. So this is a picture of your typical, you know, Phil, this was a uh, Centennial High School, and I take a ladder and I put myself up out there for the, this, these shots from out there because the fence is like seven feet. You know, and so I have to take a little small ladder. And so I go out there and I shoot towards uh, home plate there. I have a 70 to 180, not 200, but 180 millimeter Tamron lens. So this is zoomed all the way out as, you can, as far as you can go 180. I'd like to eventually get a 300, but this is all I got for now. Uh, but my camera is a 42 megapixel shot. So this is, again, the whole frame. This is what I can get by cropping in. Again, I've got a 42 megapixel sensor. Um, I crop it all the way down to 1280 by 800, and then the next shot, you look at the guy's eyes, for example, specifically the batter's eyes. If you go to the next frame, you can't see it very much on the screen, but if you look at this one, uh, you'll get a copy or be able to get it a copy of this presentation. You can look at between the frames, um, between the two. And this is a, a, after using Lightroom's super resolution, or it doubles the resolution, basically finds out the, you know, the staircasing, you know, anti-aliasing going on there and uh, Topaz Labs Denoise AI to get rid of um, some of the noise that you typically see uh, you know, in, in the background here, but it, it also does some sharpening. Now that can, this thing can really overdo the sharpening, so you really have to watch it and play with all their different options. And I believe they've got their Photo AI product that's getting better and better. I might be able to replace the uh, Denoise AI, but um, so I can get all the way from way out there in the outfield to get that kind of detail shot of the eyes. Again, I'd love to have a 300 millimeter camera uh, lens. Uh, you know, I can't afford that right now. So uh, a good crop and, and some good cleanup work and sharpening um, does wonders. And again, obviously the batters love these shots because not many photographers go to the trouble of shooting this angle. And so they just love it. Here's an example of the girls softball. Now their outfield fence is much closer in than uh, the boys' baseball. And so you don't have to crop quite as much. So again, they, they love these shots because they he, he can see the, uh, the visitor's uh, ca um, um, catcher's <laughs> facial expression there, and even the umpires have brightened that up a little bit. But anyway, again, wonderful shots. So this is uh, uh, out in the left field fence looking uh, second base on to first. And so uh, a visitor uh, runner was returning to second. And the uh, home team guy's trying to catch him, but he wasn't quite quick enough, or the ball didn't get there fast enough. But those are kind of shots that I get someone running back to first, something like that. And that's when um, the other team's up at bat, and you can't be out shooting towards you know, home plate. You may as well go do something else. Uh, Post-game pep talk, you know, by the coach. They happen, and, and a lot of photographers miss it because they think the game's over, and they go. But... Um, this was one of the more popular shots of that whole set. The coach, I guess, really liked it, or the team did. Um, going on to track and field recommendations, get permission again from the coach even to you know, be on the infield. Sometimes they're picky about that. Uh, plan for an extra busy start when the field events are occurring at the same time as the first track events. You find that out from experience. There's too much going on. Shoot everything. Uh, be brave enough to shoot discus, shot put, and long jump events head on. Just keep your distance by using a long range focal length. You know, <laughs> I want to say much more about that, but use the longer races, like the one and two mile or 1600 and 3200 meter, I guess is what they are now, um, as an opportunity to try a number of panning blur shots and get uh, candid shots of teammates interacting um, on the infield as they're waiting for their next event. So those events can last, they last 10, 12, more and more minutes. And so you got a lot of time to, to go shoot some other things. Go for the low angle shots for the more dramatic perspectives. For shots taken after sunset, use the denoiser um, applications that you've got available. So again, there's a discus. I was way out there shooting way in. There's no way she could have hit me. They don't seem to mind as long as you're out there far enough. Same thing with the shot put, you're beyond there. 
their their reach. Uh, long jump, high jump, pole vault. This is one of the better pole vaulters. I think at Centennial High School, he was getting up like 13 feet or something. So um, low angle for the running shots is just, in my opinion, it's the, the best, you know, angle. Um, relays, handoffs especially, very cool. Um, shooting head on for the um, hurdles. Uh, you can get some also good, obviously, from the side as one person is jumping over a hurdle. But I kind of like shooting from here because you can shoot the whole race from, I, I, again, I have a, I think I stepped on a chair to look over the fence. So I was way beyond, you know, where they were going to be finishing up with a long zoom. And you can unzoom as they get closer and closer and get a whole bunch of options for uh, good shots. Like this was way down at the far end. Uh, and again, just expressions, that kind of thing. Again, low shot at night, cleaned up with uh, denoise. Um, handoffs are a lot of fun. A little bit blurry, but I love the, you know, expressions and the composition. All right, soccer recommendations. My wife's from Brazil, so she's big into soccer, and so shooting more and more of those. <clears throat> Get permission from the coach, again, to be on the field, and check with the refs on the boundaries that they want you to respect because each one seems to be different. They want you behind this line, no behind this line. They have to, you know, make sure they, they do that. Obviously, depending on the caliber of the game, if it's a high school game versus a casual game, you won't even have um, refs worried about that. But uh, arrive early enough again to get shots of the team warming up together. Most of the team won't get to any game time now. Again, for a large team, that may be true. Reasonably sized team, small team, yeah, most of them do, but still, it's it's good policy to, to try to shoot some warm-up time. Uh, go for the angle shots again, and for shots taken after sunset, go for the denoiser um, stuff. So here's a couple from Centennial High School. Again, my, my kid, this is in Roswell, and my all no, now grown kids graduated from there, so all the coaches kind of know, oh, you're you know, so-and-so's dad. And so um, they at least know when I ask if I can shoot, and uh, even though my kids aren't there anymore. This is where they just scored, and they're interacting with the, you know, the crowd, the team, um, the uh, uh, their fans in the stadium, in the stands. All right, on to youth league. If you're not shooting at high school, you know, there's in the summertime, especially there are youth leagues and all kinds of things, including roller hockey. Um, and I'll, if there's a local place you could shoot that if you're interested. Uh, don't settle, okay, for, for shooting in roller hockey or hockey. Uh, don't settle for shooting from the stands or behind the plexiglass. Ask the coaches if you can shoot from within the player bench area so long as you stay clear of them entering or exiting from the rink. And they have, you have two doors at each end of their um, dugouts, I think is they, they still call them that. Um, and I've, they've actually let me go ahead and stand near one because I open and close it for them. I kind of know when they want to go on and off. Um, so anyway, just check with them to make sure that's okay. But that's the only way to shoot, I, in my opinion. Um, and use uh, F2.8 long zoom and a shutter speed of 1.500. Again, you think that's too slow. That won't stop the action. But I've never had a blurred shot at 1.500, so I don't know. Um, and then uh, shoot, set your ISO. It, um, auto, so it'll go. I set my cap at about 8,000, and your cap might vary quite a bit depending on your camera and your sensor. But that's about where I find that even Topaz um, denoise struggles with cleaning up my 8,000 ISO images. Um, anyway, so here's a couple shots. The big thing from the casual, you know, with the cell phone shots is the being able to see the faces. And you really kind of have to play a little bit with, with your settings in uh, Lightroom to make those come out but not seem like you're obviously brightening them up, that kind of thing. But uh, the, the, that's why they appreciate me being there shooting versus them doing with their cell phones because you get a whole lot more light and um, balanced light. And, and so anyway, oh, this is a place that I found that's nearby. I mean, I shoot up at uh, Petrie Corners at Picknyville Park is where they have every weekend, they have roller uh, hockey games. But here you've got, uh, see the map here. So here on the left is where we are right now. And within 35 minutes, you can be at this chill hockey rink if you ever want to shoot a hockey game. Again, just check with the coach. It's not too far away from here, not closer than Peachtree Corners. 
Okay, on to youth um, baseball. Um, just love, you know, being able to get down, eye contact with the little t-ball, you know, players. Like, oh my gosh, I hit it this time, you know, kind of expressions on their faces. Um, so, and this is one that was during a summer sandbox, sandbox is what they call them, game, um, sandlot uh, game. And uh, again, just um, the look. And this one I decided to go black and white. I know I usually don't play a whole lot with black and white, but this turned out best, I think, in black and white from the other. This was one of my earliest ones. I usually shoot again from the visitor dugout area, but you know when um, a switch hitter comes around, you got to run around to the other side to get them. And he happened to end up going ahead for a bunt anyway to get that first the, the player on first base is leading off. So I just really enjoyed the shot because he even got a little bit of whiff of the um, um, the white uh, sand or whatever it is off the bat. Um, so anyway, a lot of fun. Again, shooting the young pitchers, they love, you know, they have dreams of becoming a league pitcher. All right, on to other sports, volleyball. Just a couple of volleyball. That was post, you know, effect to add kind of action to that. And, you know, getting people in the air. And there's, there's my wife there in the T-shirt. That's why I got that shot. Um, we got... Uh, um, Sometimes, you know, they have a skateboard parks. This one's right next to the roller hockey um, le um, arena. And so I'll get there early and shoot some skateboarders. Um, again, they're a lot of fun, and they really appreciate you taking shots and letting them know where they can find their shots. Um, it's just kind of fun to, to be there trying to shoot something like um, that they would like. Uh, skaters, this is all the way down in Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Georgia. I used to go down there a lot because I'm a skater myself. I, I mostly skate distance rather than the um, between the cones. There's that shot again, and they do that a lot. But it's um, just a, a, a well, um, a wide range of type of shots you can get at a place like this because some of them are learning, some of them are doing jumps, and so like yeah, here this was at a skate um, board park, and they were just doing it on rollerblades instead of skateboards. Sort of reminds me of like a gang shot, you know, and uh, um, motorcycles, invisible motorcycles. Um, every uh, year in the fall, they have an Athens to Atlanta roller skate or skate, and uh, it's like 80 some miles, and um, it's pretty impressive. So uh, one time I shot them wrapping that game, that skate up. They do it Sunday morning, and uh, interestingly enough, Sam here, the guy on the right, uh, he's I guess about my age. And uh, he's just incredible in that most people take a car or share a ride to Athens Saturday night and then skate back to Piedmont Park or wherever. Or not. Um, yeah, that's Fourth Ward, I believe, um, uh, on Sunday morning. Well, he skates to Athens on Saturday night and then skates all the way back on Sunday. So it's kind of a fun, fun group there. Um, questions about sports? Shots, anyone? No one. All right. Huh? Hey, do you sell a lot of the question is, do I sell a lot of, the, uh, of my work? Again, pretty much what I alluded to early on, I, I do it to, um, um, pretty much to be a, a, a positive influencer in those who are taking. So again, I'll give them the card, or they know where they can find online their pictures. But uh, no, I've, I've never um, received payment for, for my pictures. Um, I have had some prints, I use metal prints, in some exhibits that people have purchased. And that's pretty much all I've, I've gotten um, as far as pay for my work. All right, on to miscellaneous type of shots. And again, this is sort of throughout the last year, times where I shot some of these kind of off-subject things, including concerts. Lighting is real important. This was at a U2 tribute band concert. The guy almost, you know, kind of looked like Bono, and, and, and their lighting was so great. It was one of my, my favorite shoots of this, this type. All right, concert recommendation. Contact the band a few days in advance and ask if you can be somewhat of an official photographer for the upcoming performance. I think there's a technical term I read recently for that. Um, be clear that you would be shooting stills, not video. 
Because most of them think, oh, you're just going to come and shoot, you're shoot video. No, you just make it clear. Can I speak from experience. <laughs> so let them know you're shooting the stills. Uh, would they be okay with you um, periodically shooting from back of the stage? I mean, that's what you see if you've got okay from the band. You, you can do that, but just double check with them on that. Arrive early enough to get shots of the uh, final setup activity. Don't forget to get the drummer in as many shots as possible. They often are hidden behind the other band members in the front. And if you look back one shot, there's you know the drummer back there. He's dimly lit, but you can at least see him. Whereas if I had a different angle, he's usually covered up by something, you know. Um, so anyway, that's one suggestion or recommendation. Um, and then get some shots uh, from behind those in the control booth uh, and behind the people in the audience. I got a couple examples there. This was down at uh, Roswell Riverfront concerts every Friday, Saturday night. Just a couple with their dog watching the band. Uh, this is booth people with the controls. You always try to get the controls so people know what are these people. Um, uh, I think this was up in Lawrence. Yeah, Lawrenceville. And then another similar thing to remember, do that uh, for fireworks displays. Don't just get the fireworks. Get nice silhouette shots of people looking at the fireworks. And I, that's what I always try to do. I rarely shoot just fireworks anymore. I always try to get behind people, don't know them, doesn't matter, they can't see their face anyway, um, and uh, get some shots like that. All right, Dragon Con just happened last weekend, happens Labor Day weekend every year. Tens of thousands of people come to Atlanta for this it's sort of like fantasy characters, you know, sci-fi characters, and it's been around for quite a long time. And um, it actually runs from Thursday through Labor Day Monday. But on Saturday morning, they have a parade of all the characters. And that's what most people will go down for. If, you, if you're there for the whole thing, you have to pay to get into various venues where they have panels of speakers and stuff like that. But if you just want to get a quick taste, you go Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, um, Labor Day weekend, and uh, you can get the parade. And it's a route from about Midtown down to Peachtree. Um, a Marta Station area in a downtown Atlanta. So um, usually I've, I've gone a couple, three times in the past. This year I actually went with a group from uh, the Roswell Photographic Society group that I'm a part of. We had about six guys that got together and shot kind of together. So, you know, again, low to the ground, shooting up. You can get, you know, the crowd nicely based around the ground to get rid of the street. Um, that, that's the optimal shot. Um, but this, this were like a couple years ago. I think if you came in early, you saw some of those that I shot this year in the rotating slideshow. Uh, those that you saw um, were from this year. This is from last year, I believe. Yeah, from last year. So this is, um, we're, um, it's not Peachtree, but it, we're, uh, it's the overpass 8575. So you get a nice clean backdrop where you can get your bouquet, you know, back and blending, you know, nothing too busy back there. And then you get all the sunlight. There's no uh, building shadows being cast on the people as they come across the bridge. So that's what I found the best place. After the parade ends, like at 11 or so, people stay down in the downtown area. Uh, the people are dressed up, go to different things going on in that area, and they're on the sidewalks. So you can grab them. And, and again, if you've ever been uh, afraid of doing street photography, shooting people, this is the optimal uh, event. Because these people spend a lot of money, sometimes, a lot of time uh, working up their outfit. And they really want you to take their picture. They love it. So unlike, you know, some other times when you're a darn do street photography where people are saying, why are you taking a picture of me? These people love it. So I'll, I'll, I'll see a unique couple like this coming, you know, along the side and say, hey, do you mind if I get a shot real quick of you? Can you come right over here? And they say, oh, yeah, sure. And they'll go and pose however I want. And again, I love the low shot here up against the buildings. Um, so again, great opportunity to try some character or street photography. Um, another thing that you could try is museums like here. Uh, this is from the Computer Museum of America that's in Roswell. Not very well um, uh, promoted. They're, they're trying to do more promotions, but um, it's got a Various section, this is where it's all the small, you know, mini computers or home computers. And then they've got an area where it's all uh, the main old mainframes, crate computers and so on. And they've got a huge section that's a space uh, program. 
with it, including a, like a three quarters size lunar lander module. It's just amazing place against the computer museum of America. They've basically asked me to volunteer to come and shoot a bunch of pictures because most of the people that are tour, this tour guide type people there are volunteers. And, I, and since I'm a big computer nerd, um, you know, I had a TRS-80 back in 79 from Radio Shack. So I'm, I'm back in the time when they had, had those. So check that out. They, they have events from time to time um, that they'd appreciate some pictures. So here's like the old card punch um, area. They have a gaming area back there behind. So um, that's one. In the wintertime, when I don't, didn't get out as much to shoot, because I just don't like being out in the cold that much, I started thinking what I could shoot indoors. And so it dawned on me, I'd seen online people shooting um, Lego figures in the real world is what they call it. And so I went out and bought a bunch of Lego figures and, and not, those are not a Lego car, but a bunch of small miniatures basically. And got a flashlight, you know, a couple lamp, you know, lights and tried to set up some different lighting and just tried different things. And this is one of the examples of that. So. You might want to tinker. Here's an example from, um, yeah, Flickr. They have a whole group that shoots these kind of pictures, basically Lego figures placed out in real-world environments, and they try to get the lighting and the focal length and everything just right so it kind of looks interesting. So that's the thing. This was my example. I posted this guy on the foot of a thing on a river, great explorer kind of thing. Another example um, out in the real world. Just something different. Um, related to that, obviously they have uh, a number of shows uh, moving around the country of things dealing with Legos. So this was at a recent local show. Um, it's kind of fun to take a you know, macro lens and try to get close in and try to shoot what looks like a realistic street scene, but uh, with Lego figures. And they're obviously pretty ornate the way they've built everything out here. Here's even a ice hockey <laughs> rink someone made up with Lego figures. Uh, similarly, um, model trains shows. Those are always fun to try to shoot, try to get, you know, this isn't the best example of focal length. I got more of the trees rather than the, you know, the bridge, but you know, those type of shots, love to try to get something different to shoot. Rodeos, um, I think they had one at Wills Park about every year, but this was up at Ball Grand, I think it was. And I've only shot one, but you know, it was fun to shoot. Again, mostly ground level, shooting up. This one especially I liked. I, it must have been a trainer just saying, you know, simmer down after he got, you know, was able to buck the guy off. Because um, usually after he's off, he just stopped shooting. I thought, no, this looks like something's happening here. <laughs> Start of the rodeo. Some people just hanging around before the uh, rodeo starts. Questions about that? Well, let me go on then. Um, on to the in-camera subject effects and highlighting. Uh, this is what I meant by that. This is the motion blur, panning blur, and light painting. I don't know if they all, especially the last one is kind of a new, seemed like a new thing. Um, so, motion blur. That's, uh, and the only examples I have of motion blur are typically car headlights. You got your camera on a tripod, uh, s s shutter speed down to 30th or slower, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, um, like 30 seconds, 20, 30 seconds, whatever it takes to get the car as it's moving along a path. And typically curves are better than straight lines, you know, something more interesting. So, um, so you're getting the motion of an object. Again, there's many more examples of types of motion blur, but again, all of mine tended to be at night <laughs> shooting headlights. Again, there's the curve there on the on the left that makes it stand out more than just these straight lines here. Uh, downtown Roswell, the fun thing about this is trying to get a shot where obviously the cars are moving, but the people sitting in the restaurants out here are not moving. So it, it's just kind of an interesting additional effect. I had a carnival, you know, moving lights. It's easy to shoot something that's uh, interesting. Panning blur is where, again, I uh, showed you with the uh, equestrian shots, you're, you're panning with the subjects to blur the background. You got your shutter speed down to 30th, 120th of a second slower, or whatever it may take. 
Again, cars are fairly easy because they're going at a straight line, a set speed. Um, horses, not so much. But So this was uh, downtown Roswell uh, during a photo walk out on the Big Creek Greenway a long time ago, just shooting bikers as they pass by. Again, they're pretty easy because they're consistent in speed, typically, and, and level. Out at um, Avalon up in Alpharetta, uh, during the winter, they have uh, the ice skating rink. Uh, for that particular venue, you have to get a, um, you have to check with security, and they give you sort of a badge for being a photographer, so people know you're out there being official photographers. This is back down at Piedmont Park, panning blur again, panning with the skaters, blurring the background. Usually, I emphasize the, the saturation quite a bit in the background, or do something to make it stand out even more than just the blur. Speed skating uh, going on in, um, I think it was up and coming. There's an arena up there where Saturday mornings they have um, speed skating lessons. And so I caught this person doing some speed skating. Casual basketball, you know, um, courts out in the um, park, um, trying to get paying. But again, these are more difficult because obviously they're not, they're, so they're moving up and down as they're running and so on. So they're harder to get. Track meet. Now, this, this brings up a point of the fact that a panning blur shot, you don't have to have uh, the whole subject uh, sharp for it to be an effective image. As long as you especially have the face, the, the, the face is the big thing. I mean, because the other parts can be pretty blurry, but if the face is crystal clear, you can get by with a bunch of additional blur. Light painting. I haven't had much experience with that, so I kind of brought this search on Google for people doing light painting. Uh, the thing I would try more and more would probably be this middle one, love, where you spell out uh, with a flashlight or some sort of LED instrument uh, a word, uh, spinning uh, light things like this one over here on the left. You know, those are pretty common. Uh, my only experience was once where I tied a flashlight to a string and started swinging it around in a circle and ran through a bridge with the camera running for about 20, 30 seconds. Just something different. Again, I thought I'd come up with something different. And then lately, I tried this with a flashlight outlining the rim of um, our car at night uh, for about a 30-second exposure. Questions about that? OK. On to unique end products. So what I mean by that is traditionally the result of our Photography projects were images which uh, could be printed and hung in an exhibit or on the walls within our home. Uh, but now the online world has provided a new venue in which additional formats can be viewed and enjoyed. So the categories after this are stereo photographs, uh, 360s, technically the 360 be a 180s, uh, panoramas, and gigapixel images, and then lastly mosaics. So for stereo photographs, um, I'm not going to spend as much time on this because I found out that most people have struggled with actually seeing using this technique. Without using a, a headgear like this to view stereo images, um, you can use what's called uh, the cross-eyed technique, where you basically cross your eyes to the point where these two images come together. And um, just you're curious, did anyone ever use that successfully, that technique? No, no. OK. So what I would have you do, just to see if you could do it, is you hold your finger out at arm's length, pointing up, and have your finger right below uh, where these two white line, uh, dots are. And what you do is you focus on the tip of your finger. And it may be harder without the lights on for you to see even the tip of your finger, the detail. But you bring it closer and closer. You keep your focus on that. And the peripheral vision in the background, you should see the two dots coming closer and closer together and finally uh, overlap. And once you get to that point where they overlap, you should be able to look up and see the, the, the duck in 3D. And if you can't do it now, you can try it later at home, you know, when you got more time to kind of fiddle with it. But uh, I'm going to move on through this, because the first time I went through this, I think I spent too much time for the amount of success we had. Basically, to create them, there's a, some free software out there. You take your two stereo pictures, and the way you take them without a true stereo lens or something or camera is you would take your, your camera, and you would um, 
make sure that the shot is taken um, perpendicular to each other or parallel to each other instead of converging. It's like you take a, you think you take that picture and then that picture, but no, you want to go exactly parallel. And so that's what I do. It looks kind of funny, but I'm taking my picture. I, I make sure I'm, I'm going exactly horizontal. Click, click. And that's where you take your two pictures, and then this software, you load them in there. It does some funky things with it to adjust the cropping and so on, and then it spits out a final image. And I've got the process outlined in this handout that we'll have available for you online. And uh, down at the bottom there, I, I mentioned how you can take advantage of a company that makes takes those pictures of yours. And instead of having to do the you know that thing, they'll make a ViewMaster reel out of it. So I've got a couple... View masters that I got from this company as they sent me the actual reels of my 3D pictures that I sent them online. And they sent me back viewable things. And again, it's too dark in here for you to probably see these, but you can welcome to come down here after the meeting and just check these out. I got two of them uh, here. If you're, if you're interested in this whole area, then there's, there's an outline that I have for you that kind of explains it. And I'm just going to go through the rest of these quickly because these are some example shots. Um, even people, if you can get people to stay still between the two shots, um, is, is a good thing to do. This is pretty good because there's a lot of close and distant objects. And we're going to move on uh, to 360s, panoramas, gigapixel. Okay, to do 360 by 180s or panoramas, you've got a number of options. One option is a live option, which is great if you want to do special video, obviously, or moving objects. So there's low-end capture devices, and this is just one of many that are out there. I can't remember exactly what the brand that is, but um, the second option is much higher-end capture devices that are higher resolution. That's the big thing. Um, and uh, they shoot, again, in one split fraction of a second, the whole 360. You don't have to um, do it in multiple shots. And then the manual multi-capture options. Okay, uh, one cannot simply pivot your body. Say you've got your camera and you want to shoot a panorama like this. You can't just take your camera, click, 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 because you're pivoting around your body. And that causes, as I point out here, cause par um, parallax errors, which creates problems for the stitching software. Um, so this is not an issue if your subject matter is all the way in the far distance, but if there's any object sprinkled throughout the area between the camera and the distant background, there's going to be these parallax er errors that will spring up. Um, there are a number of devices available you can use with your camera to resolve this issue. And one is one I use for a long time to do my 360s, and that's um, the uh, pano heads. So you put your, the, this pano head on a normal tripod, and that pivots uh, down there um, to an angle. And the camera pivots around. Basically, it's the lens of the camera rather than your body. And that's what resolves those errors. And so there's tons of options of pano heads out there. The other uh, next option is our gimbals, and I actually brought mine uh, with me today. I bought it for around three hundred dollars. It's uh, okay, so there you go. So they, you know, you can. It, it's all balanced so that no matter where you go, it's shooting in the same direction. And it, I don't use it for video <laughs> very much, but that, that's the general gist of it. But the way you use it for this solution, um, it, it comes with an app that lets you specify. What is the top uh, left corner, bottom right corner of the area you want shot? And you basically set up, as you can see, read up here, um, the sensor type, um, the type of lens you have on there, or the focal length that your zoom lens is set to, how much overlap you want, and how much delay between each shot. Once you get the area set up that you want, uh, you just hit the button, and it takes a series of images, a number of images per row, and then you can do your um, stitching with software afterwards. So it uh, automates uh, a sometimes otherwise a little bit uh, difficult process of doing rows. If I'm just doing a row for a panorama, I can do that pretty well. But uh, something like this for multiple rows is, is a whole lot better. So the last option um, for something to use through the camera to shoot these kind of shots is ultra portable and free. It's your finger. So. Um, the way that works is there's you can basically have your camera that pivots around there, or if you're doing up and down panorama shot. Um, um, so that's what I use most of the time. I, I hardly ever use a pano head anymore. If I have a real high-res gigapixel shot I'm going to take, I'll use the gimbal. 
But otherwise, if I'm out there um, like that one, um, two rows of four shots, I will go ahead and just use my finger technique um, to, to do the uh, correction for the potential parallax problem. So this is an example that says I think was just a single row. It's probably about mm, six or seven vertical shots that I just stitched together afterwards. And again, I actually could have done a, a body pivot kind of shot because there's no close objects. Maybe this thing in the middle down at the bottom there may have had a, a problem, uh, but there, there's not like trees right close up front. Everything's pretty much in the distance. So I could almost get by with doing um, without even the finger shot uh, type technique. Um, this is a unique case where I had a lens that probably only got about a quarter. Uh, actually, I think the top third, middle third, and bottom third, the, the lens that I had with me. And so I had to shoot it like that. One, two, three, I think it was four shots, horizontal shots um, from top to bottom. And the reason I couldn't back up is because there's trees and branches right there anyway. So sometimes you can't back up in order to get the full shot of something like this. So this came in pretty handy. This is down again by the lake in Martin's Landing, um, where I was able to shoot the, the, pan, the array of, of pictures and bring it home and do the stitching to, to get the final image. And then I used, I don't know if you can tell, but that's not a truly realistic shot. I, I, I decreased uh, the sharpening or the, um, uh, I always forget the term, but I, I fuzzed out the, the leaves a little bit and increased the saturation, kind of make a little bit more dreamy, paintery kind of look to it as I, is what I was shooting for. This is an example, shooting like an example of a house, three, um, what is it, six vertical shots. And I don't know if I need to get into everything. I guess I'll mention this. Um, just a part of my workflow. Again, you may be different, but if you're starting new, you might find this helpful. Um, the camera name, or the, <laughs> the file names that the camera, your camera, gives you are usually pretty cryptic here. I mean, there's a sequence number typically, but otherwise, you know, it's, it's maybe the initials of the camera model or something. So I have a, um, I've long used a directory utility program on Windows called Directory Opus. And it does a number of things dealing with organization and directory files and moving things around. But one thing it has built into it that's especially cool is a renumbering uh, or renaming um, utility. And so you can uh, select a bunch of files, uh, open up the utility, and then you can specify what you'd like uh, the file to be renamed as, and then a sequence number. So I always do my initials, PDP, year, month, day, uh, underscore, and then the sequence number. And that's how I keep my, my um, files organized or how I rename all of my pictures. So going on from there. So in uh, Lightroom, um, over up here on the right, uh, you can see that I organize my pictures um, by year, and then under each year folder, I have a separate folder for each shoot that I do. And I name the folders for my shoot, the year dash month dash day underscore and a brief description. Again, you all got your own workflow for this kind of thing. But again, some of you might be new and this might be helpful showing you the way I keep things organized. So I bring my six images into this new folder called House Pano. And then uh, um, Lightroom has a built-in photo merge panorama feature that lets you blend those two together. And it does a pretty respectful job with this simple um, shot. Um, there's some um, options that you can use to tweak things, but uh, not a whole lot compared to some of the competition out there. And so I use one of the competitions. Um, and to get it to that application, I have to export it from Lightroom after I made any adjustments. And then I bring them into, if you open the upper left corner here, it's PTGUI Pro. It's one of the main program software applications out there for stitching images. Probably one of the more reputable ones out there. The one advantage that I want to highlight right now that has over um, Lightrooms is uh, something called masking. So if you notice in the middle of the picture here, it shows the number of the picture, one through six. And uh, in picture one, I actually cut and pasted myself standing there in front of uh, the stoop there of the house. And I don't want me in there. So you notice up here where it lists the different pictures, 
um, I'm in the picture one, but I'm not in picture two where it overlaps. So uh, what you can do is use the mask, and I'll go to the next picture here. And over here in the bottom left, you'll see I had, took a green and I made a line right down this area for picture two. I'm, I'm highlighted picture two up here in the upper right, and that I drew a green line on picture two. And what it is, it pushed where two was used in the picture over on top of the one. So if I go back and forth, you'll see up there, look, see, I'm, I'm there, number picture one, but two pushed me out, so I'm not there any longer. So that's, they call that masking, where you can uh, influence where it draws the lines of where, what one image versus the next. So again, it's, it's kind of a technical thing, but again, if you get into stitching big, you know, get something like this, PTGUI Pro is very, very great. Again, the handout that I've given you um, mentions that specifically. This is an extremely, well, this gets into gigapixel shots. So if you read the description here, um, I shot a 23 by 6 array of images. So basically on each row of 6, I shot 23 pictures, each a three-bracket shot, so I could create HDRs. So for post, I started with 414 original images and combined them into one final 48,192 by 23,335 uh, HDR image. And I go on to mention some other things. But so you look at the full image. This is um, Buckhead, obviously, from um, the vantage point of, I can't remember the name of the building I was in. But uh, I had, um, I don't think I had my gimbal at that time. I shot it manually with a pano head. So if you look at, okay, here, uh, maximum magnification when viewed in the Flickr website. I'm going to contrast the, you know, when I post my pictures to my Flickr creative account. They can uh, bring up on the screen as much of a, I think, a 6,000 pixel resolution. So if you look, compare this image uh, uh, with this one. So see that the building there, uh, a little bit to the left of center. That's where it's, this other site that's custom geared towards gigapixel shots called Gigapan. Look how much closer now. Look at the top, uh, top center. There is a guy on a balcony. Can you see him there? You can't. But if you go to Gigapan, <laughs> you can you can even see him. It, it, it's that much of a resolution bust. And you could probably, uh, I, if you go online, you can zoom that pan around very fluidly. I decided not to try to do something live at this point. So I have this series of pictures. So to explain Gigapan, it used to be a commercial site. You had to pay for it, but now it's not supported anymore, but it's maintained by someone. I don't know. It's been years this way. So you can go and sign on, uh, get yourself an account set up, and then you download the upload software that you would upload your image uh, to this, this profile that you set up. And, you know, again, you, you select where's the, the, what the file is that you've created with your stitching software. Uh, the title in the description, and your um, profile sign-on and password, and it'll upload the image. And so, again, this is um, at, from a lighthouse in Savannah, Savannah Beach, I guess, and uh, it was a full 360, actually. I, I went around the lighthouse, and I took a picture, took a picture, all the way around the back side of the, the, the uh, top of the lighthouse. Um, and so, again, just to show you the depth here, the, the, where we're going to be... Zooming into is this little lighthouse right there. So you go one click, there it is, and another click. And again, that's the kind of resolution you come up with. And it's just fun to pan around and just see any kind of detail um, that, that you'd like. And it's, it's just some again, you wouldn't print and hang on your wall um, or you know put it in an exhibit necessarily. Now this would come in handy if someone wanted a wall size mural of some shot and say, yeah, I can deliver that. It's called a good pixel shot. And, You'll have as much detail as you want on that huge wall mural. Um, but that, that's a, one of the later examples of a gigapixel shot that I uh, shot recently. Mosaics. And this isn't uh, the type where it's a printed mosaic, and you can kind of see the individual pictures just looking back a little bit. These are gigapixel-sized um, mosaics. And there is a commercial aspect that you could utilize for this, like wedding uh, events. Um, where you take all the pictures dealing with engagement or the growing up and engagement pictures, wedding shots, and after, and put them all together in a final mosaic. So you get a 
hundreds of pictures, as many as you can get, and then decide on a picture that you want to be the center picture of the mosaic or the main picture. So in this case, this is my family picture from back in the 70s. <laughs> there I'm in the back uh, center there. And um, we can tell by looking at the upper left corner there, this is going to be a five gigapixel shot, um, which is pretty big. And so the software called Andrea Mosaic uh, takes all those little pictures and your main picture, and with a whole bunch of tweaking, uh, you specify where those little images are, you specify the size that you want, and then it creates the image. And again, if you um, if I read the description here, it's created from 344 family images. So, um, again, you look at the image itself, and it looks mm, kind of choppy or whatever, but you can definitely tell the features. You can tell there are people and then the smiles and so on. You start zooming in, and I'm going to zoom in on my face up there. So you begin to see, oh, yeah, there's some little pictures in there. And I'm going to zoom way into my nose at this point. And you can see there really are detailed pictures all the way down to where you can read text on those little pictures. So again, the whole idea is that you could, uh, for uh, a person who wants it, I want a family picture just like this one. And they give you hundreds of their family pictures to put, include, and you could provide them. Again, it's not only an online thing. You can't hang this on your, on your wall, but it's a, it's a unique kind of oddity type thing where Wow, that's made up of, now there's only 344 unique pictures in there. Obviously, there's millions of pictures in there, so it had to reuse a lot, uh, all those pictures. But, uh, but again, you know, you can kind of see some duplicates probably. You can tell it to keep the same picture a certain number of, you know, pictures apart so you really can't easily see the duplicates. Um, so anyway, that's, that's uh, mosaics. Any questions? All right. Let me check my time here because I got only one section left. Yeah, we're right at one at two thirty. So this last section doesn't take too long, and that is my workflow. So you can read all that at any point later on. It's in the you know, handout, but the, I just wanted to focus on these two points. Um, um, I edit the remaining images from the previous steps, uh, starting with cropping, leveling, color correction, and adjustments. Uh, to shadows uh, and highlights that reveal greater detail, and then use various tools to adjust the image's lighting so the viewer's eye goes to where you'd like it to go, and that's what they were just talking about earlier this morning for the review uh, session. So HDR, I'm going to buzz through this because I think all of you are familiar with this. HDR had a bad rap early on because a lot of people used extreme settings to get sort of abstract effects, and people thought, oh, that doesn't look very attractive. But if you use H HDR for, for natural results, it, it's very helpful. Uh, now, with the, the sensor sensitivity you got in the cameras today, this has almost become unneeded. But in certain situations, you, you really can take advantage of it. I mean, some um, the camera sensors, you take a picture like this over here on the left, and you could bring up the shadows to an acceptable level and not worry about doing a multiple shot HDR. But I, I just wanted to give an example. This is from uh, a room in our home, looking out the window, got my uh, bike there in the thing. And so different exposure levels. This is high, standard, and low. And then if you bring them into um, Lightroom's Photo Merge HDR, it'll come up with a fairly reasonable you know, uh, result where you can see the bike and the outdoor uh, together. And there, here's the... Again, the examples at the top were the originals. And so what it kind of did is it took uh, the lighting over here on the right, used that. I'd say it used the middle one for this little bar of curtain, which is about the same. And then it used, obviously, that one for more of that. So it grabs the best of each. If you're not uh, familiar with HDR, that's pretty much the basics of it. It's grabbing um, um, the optimal parts of each of the bracket shots to get an optimal image. And so the other thing I use to do that rather than Lightroom's built-in one is Photomax Pro. And very reputable industry. I'm going to go pan through this. The, the advantage is you can save a number of settings that worked for you well in the past and then easily select one that would work for this particular set that you've loaded in. Um, so, and there's obviously tons more <coughs> adjustments over here on the, on the left, depending on which module you use. 
uh, to make the, the adjustments that you think would bring an optimal uh, result. And then lastly, some uh, before or after examples of cropping and shifting of light. Uh, again, they covered this a little bit in some of the examples this morning, but you know, here's the raw shot with the, at the dog park. Uh, here's the cropped and uh, lighting adjusted you know, result, much more pleasing. This is a huge one. This is, again, where does your uh, eye go? Well, maybe the shirt over here on the right, but on the back side, unfortunately, of the guy here. So you work with the light enough, and you come away with something like that, which, again, you may have personal taste for maybe too much on the face or something like that, but uh, that was my um, optimal uh, image um, from, again, the former. So, again, you, you use Lightroom or um, similar things, Photoshop, to, to move the light to where you want the, the eye to go. And then this is an example of red Georgia clay is not very attractive. It's bright and it's red. So um, I did a number of other things for this image, but that was mostly it to get the uh, brightness and the saturation away from there, um, bring the, the, the eye, you know, it was mostly on the shirt, still maybe too much on the shirt, but at least it gets the eye up and a little bit further out in the field. And I think that is it.